Okay, dear friends, it's great to be part of this uh, historic week. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Esa, Esa Sarin, and I'm, uh, as Raimo said, uh, I, I'm a philosopher here in uh, Aalto University, and my theme will be systems intelligence. The way I'm going to proceed is uh, one that I hope would be quite inspirational. So, so rather than uh, instructional, so, so my idea is not so much to cover the topic of systems intelligence, but rather to give an idea of what it might be in a way that would uh, uh, carry you forward as an individual. Uh, there's a couple of uh, sort of, uh, well, sort of axioms for me. Uh, uh, one kind of axiom for me is uh, this kind of idea of, uh, of something good hiding as part of the way a human being is constituted. So, so and, and actually to me this is, isn't an opinion or a philosophy. Uh, it's not something to be debated in my view. It's, it's just a fact. Uh, and and uh, it could be that some such uh, potential that you have for some reason just haven't received from your part focus. Or it could be that it did receive focus but at an inappropriate time, or from the point of view of the context, uh, it, it just didn't fly. So, so whatever the reason is, the fact is that there is uh, always something that doesn't meet the eye in us as human beings that is good. So this is kind of axiom number one. Axiom number two to me is just the idea that uh, when it comes to uh, generating or living or of bringing about better life, better thinking is helpful. So, so uh, and it could be that the better thinking could be rational thinking, could be well argued thinking, but also would be highly associative thinking. So it could be uh, very subjective, let's say in the course of one and a half hours, in the course of, uh, of one week. You might get an association, uh, some thought that relates to a theme that isn't even discussed by the speaker. But for some reason you just started to think about it. So, so uh, it's that kind of uh, better thinking facilitates or gives a platform for better life. That is the other kind of axiom for me. Uh, so you can say this is a, this sort of broad philosophical, in some sense, thinking. It's 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 not sort of science in any sense. So uh, if you think about uh, Constantino's uh, reference to CP's nose, uh, two cultures, sort of the humanistic culture, the scientific culture. This is sort of uh, what you might perhaps relate to humanistic culture more, uh, uh, more naturally. But to me, it isn't really some kind of cultural thinking. It's just sort of kind of attitude to life sort of stuff. Now, uh, one point that I think is noteworthy is the fact that if you look at, let's say, sports, you know, yesterday Finland won. Canada, 4 to 0, very exciting. Uh, but if you look at sports, uh, ice hockey, basketball, what you see in the beginning of a game are certain kind of rituals, or at least something that is repeated again and again. Like for instance, ice hockey, what happens is that the players uh, go around the goalie before the game in a fairly tight pack. The idea is not, not to check if we have a goalie. <laughs> so it's not sort of like a cognitive point. 
that needs reassurance. It's just that for some reason people react to uh, uh, physical proximity. And it's just a plain fact. Or, or, or in, in basketball what you see before the games is that players are announced to the court and as they come they greet one another. And, and you know, these are huge guys. So it's, it's quite an event, you know, it's just a sort of give me five kind of thing. Also in, in NBA what you see nowadays quite a lot is that uh, players jump in the air and sort of collide with their, 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 their chests. <laughs> I'm not recommending this very widely <laughs> for the more context, but of course, <laughs> you know, of course it's a possibility, you know, uh, to sort of create energy with, uh, with a minimal investment. And the minimal investment is, for instance, doing a give me five or looking at the person in a particular kind of way. So, so with this in mind, let me suggest that we would take here some 30 seconds and generate here a beautiful moment of, sort of tender and dynamic moment of meeting. So probably involving give me fives, may maybe shaking hands, power hugs, <laughs> cheek kisses, you know, all forms of dy dynamic, tender, beautiful uh, uh, encountering acts. So please stand up and, and generate. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> You know, uh, as, as, as Raimo said, my, my lectures here in Aalto are quite popular, so, you know, typically my, my lectures are taken for credit by some 500 students. But even more come to the lectures themselves, because some students just uh, come there to, to, to sort of uh, inspire themselves. And, and they're not taking it for credit. They might have taken it for credit, let's say, two years earlier. Uh, and and uh, some bring their uh, parents with them. <laughs> Bec because, because, you know, I'm very popular among mothers. And even grandmothers. <laughs> and so so, so, so I, I think it's, it's, it's great, but, but you know, uh, I like to start a lecture this way. Uh, first of all, I'm there at the door to greet everybody uh, each time, you know, 500, 600 students uh, or people. Uh, and and then, then, then uh, uh, before the lecture itself starts, I point out the fact that it's an interesting group of people. So, so, uh, so let's greet one another in a tender and dynamic way. And then people do what you just did. And, and uh, you say, to me, it's, it's like uh, something beautiful. Uh, but not only beautiful, I, I think it uh, prepares for the kind of concentration that I think is, is useful in a, at least the kind of lecture context that I myself uh, aim at. Concentration, because it's easier to concentrate if you don't fear you know, instinctively, subconsciously people around you. If you sort of feel that these are pretty good people. So, and, and, and surprisingly, you know, some 15 seconds well spent without even having that in mind can still generate that outcome. You say, isn't that sort of intelligent, given the systemic context? And, 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 and uh, well, that's, that's what I like to do. And it's, it's, it sort of brings out, uh, I think, one aspect of this basic point, this basic axiom of mine, there's more to us that meets the eye kind of thing that it, it's, it's highly possible that when you have a context, when you have, as it were, uh, a local system, that some aspects of that system are surprisingly restrictive when it comes to human behaviors. So that although, of course, anybody can create anybody with whom the person is in a lecture room, it's still most of the time in most lecture halls in the world doesn't happen. It's just a fact of life. Because the systems are constituted in universities when it comes to lectures in such a way that there are this kind of uh, surprisingly, you say, restrictive conventions in place. So, so uh, it's in that context 
where I'd like to uh, place the following uh, line of thought. Here is a remarkable person I had the honor of coming to know about 10 years ago in Miami. We were both uh, in, the, in the wedding of, uh, of, of the son of, uh, of a mutual friend, uh, son. So, so uh, the son got, uh, got, got, got married and it was very emotional because the son of this mutual friend of ours is in a wheelchair. So, so, uh, so I'm sitting there and I, I saw this, this elderly couple. And, and uh, I said to the person next to me, do you know who this elderly couple is? Because they seem to be interesting. It seemed to me that they had magic left in their relationship, which some couple can have. You know, many people don't have it, but some people do have it. So I said, do you know who this couple is? And, and uh, the person next to me said, yes, that's, uh, that's Professor Edmund Phelps, the 2006 uh, uh, Nobel laureate. He had just won the prize, and, and uh, he, he was there, and that's his uh, Argentinian wife, Viviana. After the, uh, <laughs> uh, after the ceremony, I went to talk to them, saying, uh, you know, uh, in introducing myself first, and then saying, excuse me for saying this, but I couldn't help noticing the fact that, you know, you have magic in your love. So, what's the secret of your love? I said to the Nobel laureate and his Argentinian special lady. And they got excited about this question. So we started to talk. Then uh, uh, we went to the garden, where there was dinner. So uh, Professor Phelps said, yes, why don't you come to our table? Because there wasn't any fixed seating. Why don't you come to our table? So I went with them, which was great. And, and there was this, this round table taking maybe 12 people or so. And we are discussing their things, and, and he's such a great guy, very, 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 uh, very open, interested, uh, very generous. And this, this mutual friend of ours had really arranged, you know, everything. So, so beautiful food, excellent wine. So uh, after maybe two hours, maybe two and a half hours, once again the glasses are filled with excellent Italian wine. A really, really beautiful wine. Once again the glasses are filled. <laughs> And also, Professor Phelps's glass is also filled. And as it's filled, Mrs. Phelps says very loudly, Ned, that's enough. <laughs> now, having heard that line myself a few times, <laughs> I could tell that Professor Phelps took it quite a bit more constructively than I have taken de facto the same line in various actual situations. In short, it seemed like he would have internalized the point that you could be a Nobel laureate in economics, but it's still possible that you can't count to five. <laughs> in certain systemic contexts, I mean, let's say uh, over two, two, uh, two and a half hours, as the glasses are filled uh, um, on the fly. So to me, this is an interesting overall point, sort of where, 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 where your rationality, in a sense, breaks down. And, and, and uh, well, uh, I've come to know uh, Professor Phelps, uh, and, and since those, uh, those days, he's published a book, Mass Flourishing, from Princeton University Press. And, and I want to ask him, Ned, what's your main contribution to economics? And he said, well, uh, I think a lot of people would say that I've tried to bring people back to economic theorizing. Be bring people back. I mean, an outsider uh, could be sort of surprised to hear that people have been ejected from economic theorizing in the first place. But similarly, you could say, hey, uh, think about uh, what's happening in these various universities in, in their philosophy departments. There are these, these uh, specific places where philosophy is being at the highest possible level. Very, very seriously, it's been uh, exercised. So what kind of thinking does it generate from the point of view of the sort of Socratic idea of, uh, of, of facilitating better life? 
in the actual lives of people who, as a result of encountering Socrates, come to think about things in some new, more helpful, beneficial, constructive, forward-pointing ways? The answer is, uh, by far, almost everything that is happening in, the, in actual fact, in philosophy departments around the world, doesn't communicate with anybody. Not even with the, the next department's other experts, be it those bi biologists, be it those uh, bi psychologists, sociologists. I mean, it's, it's rare for these departments, actually, any of them really to talk to one another. You say, but isn't this one of the key points of uh, what it means to be a human being, so to be able to communicate, you know, to sort of reach out to the other one? This is the context, from my point of view, of the, you could say, uh, uh, initiative of systems intelligence, which uh, uh, Raimo once described in the following way. I, I, this is my sort of version of what Raimo said, but, but let me say it this way. Uh, I mean, Raimo's an engineer. To me, he's such a brilliant engineer. But he's also, I think, uh, the kind of uh, um, engineer that you would want to see more of in the world. But this was uh, Raimo's point. You know, uh, an engineer looks, looks at some, uh, as, as, uh, some, some system from the point of view of bringing in a, an, an, a, 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 an effect upon that system. With the result that there is some change that happens which then moves the whole thing forward. And this is fine. Uh, particularly if, if you know what this thing here is, so, so you can evaluate what's the best thing to push in there given the mechanisms involved so that you get exactly what you want in your uh, effort to move forward. But Raimo's point was that there typically is kind of an invisible system also. And, and, and it's, it's good if it isn't, but if there is, uh, you know, very often there is, you know. And it's, 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 it's sort of something happening in the background, which in fact brings about whatever was brought about here. So in fact, it wasn't just this line that brought it about, there was this, this sort of hidden thing involved. So, so uh, should that be the case? And of course, very often it's not the case, but in some cases it is the case. So should that be the case? Wouldn't you want to sort of influence the, the system also through here, through the sort of the, the, the invisible part? This was the question. Because it could be that actually what comes out then is, is quite a bit more. I mean, putting it differently, Sometimes you can identify a system. Let's say my mobile phone just now has some kind of bug. So, so uh, it's, it's not functioning uh, that well. It's, it's, uh, every now and then something strange happens. So, so, uh, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a separate entity, separate uh, identifiable objective system which I can bring to specific experts who then analyze the thing and they bring about relevant effect upon the thing and sure enough uh, it starts to work. Which is beautiful if you have that luxury of looking at the system from outside. But much of the time when it comes to the systems in the midst of which we actually live don't allow for that luxury. For instance, it could be that the system is something that is only emerging. Uh, or it could be that you're yourself part of the system. So you are embedded in the system. And, and, and so the system is influencing you, but you also influence the system. I mean, somebody goes to a lecture room and the person doesn't say hello to the people around him. You say, why, why is that? That's because when the person opened the door, the system already started to embrace him or her. With the result that the structure degenerated behavior and the behavior was not meeting other people who are their behavior. So although it's technically trivially easy, it's just that the person somehow doesn't use the competence. Just like you know, if somebody is a Nobel laureate in economics, it's absolutely certain that the person could count to five if five is the number of wine glasses he was served in the past in the, in, during the one two hours period. 
It says that for some reason the person very often doesn't, as it were, implement the skill. So, so it was in that kind of context where, where we started to think about uh, uh, what we then started to call uh, systems intelligence. And this is the first uh, sort of semi-definition, some kind of effort to, 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 to point the phenomenon that we are after. And, and, and uh, I mean, it's sort of slightly worded. But the idea there really is uh, just to sort of observe the fact that, that, that uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to look at intelligence in such context where you are, uh, as it were, embraced by something that involves interaction, something that involves feedback, and where, you, uh, where your intelligence at least partly depends on how you perceive you Self, yourself as part of the whole and, 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 and uh, the influence of the whole upon yourself because it gives you also make the possibility of influencing back a little bit. So, so you have that kind of, uh, that, that kind of uh, feedback intensive in, uh, uh, environment uh, where, where, where the interdependency is, is, is a key point. So, so let's talk about intelligence is that kind of, that kind of setup was the, uh, uh, was the idea. And, and uh, this was something that, let, let, let me say it slightly differently, which, uh, which related to uh, something that had happened uh, in, in, in the year 2000. Because in the year 2000 what happened was, first, uh, I had resigned from University of Helsinki. The reason why I had res resigned from University of Helsinki was that I had become tired of academic life. I didn't want academic life because I felt it's too restrictive. But through the 90s, I had the possibility of, of working a lot with uh, various Finnish companies. And this was uh, uh, the heyday of Nokia. So I had uh, seminars, lectures, workshops for, for Nokia around the world. And Nokia was number one in the world. So it was really exciting. So, so, and it was that kind of applied approach that to me was the idea of philosophy anyway. So, uh, so I, I quit University of Helsinki. And, and one of my main efforts had been since 1995, it's still continuing, but, but the effort had been going on for five years at that time, when Raimo came there, so-called Paphos Seminar on Cyprus. So, so this, this, uh, the idea there is, to, to, to bring people to Cyprus, to a nice environment, uh, detached from their immediate concerns uh, and, 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 and uh, job concerns and so forth. Uh, nowadays the group is about 100 people, 120 people, fairly big group. And work like we are here working for an hour and a half. Sort of each with his or her own thoughts. So, but it takes for one week. So, Raimo was there in 2000. We had known one another uh, uh, since the 80s. And, and, and uh, so, so Raimo was there and on the, on the plane uh, back, Raimo said, you know, Esa, you should come to Helsinki University of Technology. I said, I'm not interested in academic life. Well, but you don't understand, Esa, we are engineers. <laughs> you know, we are interested not in academic life, but upon the real life. That's our main interest. And, and not only life itself as a sort of descriptive uh, theme to, to sort of describe, but as something that we want to improve. This is what you are trying to do. You want to improve life. And what's more is that, uh, that, that our approach to engineering is uh, what I call systems engineering. The systems engineering, you look at holes with the idea of understanding those holes because you want to improve the hole. This is what you are doing. So, so, so your representation methods, your, your intervention methods might be different, but the overall 
approach is the same. I suggest you would come to Helsinki University of Technology and do what you are already now doing for engineers in companies before they graduate and become fixed in their thinking, which always happens to some extent. So this was Raimo's opening. And, and uh, he arranged for that, and, and then we started to collaborate. And it was very much, I think, something that uh, uh, C.P. Snow would have uh, cherished. Uh, then, 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 then uh, in our seminar, a mutual seminar, Raimo came up with this, this, this phrase, systems intelligence. It was Raimo's inter invention, the word, which I think is very important. I mean, one of the contributions of philosophy, I think, is, is that it can provide useful words. And, and, and what's the usefulness of a word is that it, it, it can give you something to sort of make as a reference point for your thinking. So you can gather together things that are easily uh, uh, led separate. But if you think about succeeding in holes which are perhaps emergent, and which you can't step outside if you think about that system's intelligence. It's pretty certain that it's going to have a number of different kinds of factors. So it's not likely to reduce to some, some one simple thing. I mean, for one thing, if you can't step outside, you, do, you don't have the kind of possibility which you do have when you look at something from outside, which is the, the uh, um, uh, faculties of objective thinking, for instance. Objective thinking is great, but if you are in the midst of something, you don't have full use of that, uh, 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 that luxury. So, so we started to investigate into uh, systems intelligence in that sense. And, and, and we did a lot of work with, uh, with the people on our team the key, key person was uh, Juha Törmänen, and, and, and uh, we, we tried to find key, uh, uh, key lines or key sentences that people could perhaps use in their self-evaluation uh, in the dimension of succeeding in holes. Because some people are successful within holes even when they don't even know what the hole is. So, so we just tried to find what, what were the key aspects there. And, and uh, this is the short list. Uh, the, lo the longer list uh, uh, is, is, um, uh, has, ha has uh, uh, four items for, for each factor, as it turned out the factors to be. On the left here, quite sort of different kinds of things. Like, for instance, if you think about uh, systemic perception, well, you can, okay, systemic perception, so if you're an ice hockey player, you need ability to read that environment. And what might that mean? Well, uh, that you somehow can look at the big picture, which means, you know, what's happening, uh, 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 you know, around the ice. It's a big picture. And not only what's happening around the ice right now, but also what's happening perhaps in the future on that skate, so, so uh, on that ice. So you keep, but at the same time you keep the details in mind also. So, so uh, the big picture probably is domain specific. But some people are able to read situations from the point of view of details and the domain specific overall situation. Uh, forming a rich overall picture of that kind of setup. So that would be systemic perception, which is quite different from, let's, let's say, uh, um, your, your possibilities in terms of the, uh, your attitude. I mean, attitude is something that you don't choose on the occasion. It's something that as it were, colors everything you do. And some people have the attitude of having a positive outlook on the future. Uh, very often we take this to be kind of a personality characteristic. You know, somebody just this more pessimistic, another is more optimistic. But what we do know is that when it comes to succeeding in holes, on the whole, it's good to have a positive outlook on the future. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so these, uh, these eight factors came out after very, very careful, painful, 
uh, research and, and, uh, and the only point I'm making here right now, I'm not going into the details here, I'm just observing that these are quite different kinds of things. Uh, you know, somebody can perceive uh, in a given domain, in a given context, as to where, what's the relevant kind of dynamism, what's, how does the market behave, without being able to attune uh, to people at all. I mean, it could be that the person is a tremendous expert when it comes to look at, looking from outside at a given domain, but the person just can't attune to anybody. Which, of course, is, is bad news from the point of view of those other people with whom the person probably is trying to get success in that hole. So, so uh, uh, also effective respons uh, responsiveness. You know, some people have tremendous abilities for attunement, but they can't get things done. And, 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 and so, so uh, also somebody can get things done, but not really the right things in, in the long run. Because the person doesn't sort of look at things in the long run. Okay, so, so you have eight different kinds of parameters here, ending up with reflection. I think this is uh, particularly worth emphasizing here for reasons I'm going to return to. But, but notice that very, very often when it comes to, let's say, my sessions in, in companies, what companies want is, 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 uh, 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 is, is a, give us a lecture that will inspire us, that will move forward, particularly when it comes to, to the new, new uh, orientation to customers, this new service industry kind of emphasis, uh, uh, particularly when it comes to the, the team building. You know, the typically companies have some agenda on mind. But notice that reflection is something that points beyond any particular point in an agenda. And that's why the reason, uh, that fa that's, that's the key reason, I think, for the, for the fact, and I think it is a fact, that, that very often in company contexts, uh, uh, managers are not that interested in reflection. Because they're actually interested in getting a solution to a given immediate concern. So, so uh, but reflection is still a capability that each of us have. It's just like you say, the professor that doesn't meet anybody at the door, then goes to the front and starts to sort of instruct people, isn't really aiming at bad teaching. I mean, the, the, the professor isn't aiming at people not reflecting, for instance. It's just that he believes that this is exactly what the professor should do. The professor should be the expert of the theme and tell students about the theme. If they don't want to internalize it, so much worse for them. So, so, so uh, uh, the, the, the theme of reflection, when pushed aside, isn't pushed aside, as it were, be because uh, uh, managers or anybody else would want to be non-reflective. It's just that it, it might happen in a given uh, uh, um, systemic uh, context. Now, with all this in mind, let me let me show you a little video cut. This is two minutes, and, and uh, it, it, it's, it's going to come from the film Invictus, uh, in which Morgan Freeman is uh, playing the part of uh, uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, Matt Damon is uh, uh, playing the part of the rugby captain of, of South Africa by the name of Francois Pinard, uh, of course both real persons and, and the film itself is based on historical facts. Uh, and what we do know is that these people are pretty much as they are depicted in the film. Also we know that some such meeting did take place. But, but, but what interests us is, is, uh, is, is two minutes of this encounter. So let, let me just play two minutes and then, then come back to this uh, and, and, and analyze that a little bit further. But the two minutes. Now, now, now if, if you think about, uh, if you think about uh, what we just saw there, uh, from the point of view of that uh, uh, eight, uh, uh, those, those eight factors that I mentioned are kind of pretty distinct. 
And, and, and if you think about, for instance, uh, what happens there at the very beginning is that uh, uh, Mandela is behind his desk. The guest steps in, but Mandela drops everything he was doing at the moment the guest arrives. This is possible for a human being to sort of immediately seize the situation, sort of uh, effectively respond to what actually now is happening. And, and uh, also, of course, it's possible to show interest in the other one. Tell me, Francois, how is your angle? Uh, it's, it's, it's possible to do so in a kind of uh, air that is warm. I mean, if you think about uh, something like uh, atmosphere leadership, the, the, the warmth versus coldness as, uh, as a dimension there, you could say uh, quite a remarkable atmosphere leadership on the part of Mandela in this clip demonstrating warmth and more generally you could say uh, uh, desire to operate through uh, the dimension of attunement which uh, of course uh, anybody has it's just that it could be that various systemic contexts could be such that they don't immediately encourage the use of it now remember uh, Raimo's initial point regarding uh, systems engineers in his view. The idea was that, that uh, we, we want to look at holes, but not just look at them, we want to improve holes. Now, let's assume that, that uh, part of that hole one wants to improve is constituted by people. And let's, uh, let's assume that as you uh, look at that hole partly constituted by people, involving people in the genuine sense of the word. So you haven't abstracted, to, let's say, to the concept of, uh, of, of a labor market, claiming that, well, you have people in your theory because you have the concept of a labor market. So, so uh, if you have genuine people, you have the ability to attune and to react to attunement. So. Uh, should it be the case that one would want to improve upon a given situation from the point of view of uh, systems intelligence uh, theory, if, if we use that expression? You could say, well, one possibility would be to evaluate oneself in these eight dimensions and, and, and do those uh, uh, also in a way that is perhaps domain specific, because it's maybe likely that uh, at your laboratory, at work, it could be that, that, that you actually are more successful, more systems intelligent in that context than, let's say, in your marriage. This is the case with uh, quite a few people. And this is because in the marriage context, it's surprisingly difficult for people to sort of attune to the other one. And, and also it could be that uh, uh, positive engagement is surprisingly difficult after all these years sort of thing. So the person could uh, evaluate himself or herself using the systems intelligent inventory and hopefully doing that realistically. Of course, any inventory is useful only if you do it realistically. In fact, you might ask somebody else to give some feedback regarding your evaluation if you want to be realistic. But you want to improve things. So what might that mean? That would mean that uh, as you score yourself, perhaps uh, with the help of a uh, of, of, of trusted friend, you then look at what are some of those, um, the, the, those, those uh, um, aspects in, in your uh, 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 attempts to succeed within holes where you might make a particularly strong headway with uh, attention to that particular dimension. And, and uh, it's, it's here, I think, where this, this um, Mandela clip is quite powerful towards the end. Towards the end, Mandela asks his uh, guest, uh, tell me, Francois, what is your philosophy on leadership? 
He's taking seriously his guest. Tell me, François, what is your philosophy of leadership? And uh, the rugby captain answers, by example, sir. I've always lead, taught to lead by example. That is right. That is exactly right. I mean, you, you, you can't really do anything if you don't commit yourself to doing it. If you don't demonstrably do it yourself, how can you expect others to do it? Those that you're supposed to lead. But then Mandela goes on and says, but how do you make people to be even more than they believe they can be? That is interesting to me. Notice what this means. This, this way of posing a question. How do you make people to be more than they believe they can be? I believe it points to that uh, axiom I mentioned in the beginning. To the fact that there's this kind of hidden dimension in people. It could be that people themselves disregard that dimension. But as a leader, you know, uh, uh, maybe you would want to focus upon that. So let's assume that as a leader you do focus upon it. And so what do you do? I mean, putting it differently, if you are involved in a whole, in a system in which you have people, and let's assume that it is a fact, let's assume, that, that people might believe that they are less than they actually can be. As a leader, isn't it in your rational interest to try to somehow make people come out with that, uh, that hidden dimension of theirs, because you believe it exists? This is the question. So, the question of systems intelligence now is, how are you intelligent with respect to such a context? Now, let's assume that you're an engineer by training. If you're an engineer by training, this is the way you are likely to think about change. You, ident you identify the objective factors and then you push in the relevant kind of uh, uh, input with respect to those factors and you get the effect. And, and this is fine to the extent that you are dealing with a system that has this kind of luxury about it. But should it be the case that there is uh, quite a lot hiding? Should it be the case that there is, for instance, uh, expectations, beliefs, motives, you know, some kind of deeper thoughts involved? Should it be that, you know, uh, how life is perceived, how other people are perceived, how tasks are, are perceived, is also part of the bigger system? You might want to be intelligent with the bigger system. And, and, and this, is, uh, this is the context, I think, where we've tried to uh, provide a conceptual help for people with the concept of systems intelligence. Because the fact is that we somehow, as human beings, do manage exactly that kind of setups. Because we do manage to be intelligent in highly complex systems that have this structure. And, and if we can't deny the fact that of course we could do it better. How? Well, for instance, if you have tremendous abilities to read the dynamisms of various situations and you have tremendous capabilities of, of uh, moving things forward immediately, but you don't have such uh, uh, abilities to control your emotions as is needed if you want to act wisely. Because the fact is that even when people swallow your uh, bad behavior on the spot, it, it takes its toll in the longer run. So, so, uh, so it would be wise for you to think about from the dimension of wise action, for instance, using our terminology. So, so, uh, so, so it's in this context where the following uh, uh, very simple uh, line of thought I hope, will, I hope is useful. Uh, you know, my special lady comes from Lapland. As I said, you know, she's a redhead from Lapland. She's, she's really a power lady, you know. We are talking about a heavy duty package. And, and, and uh, you know, everybody loves her, you know, Raimon knows her well, and you know, she, she's really a very, very impressive lady. But when you are married, 
you know, with this kind of power package. It, it sort of places certain challenges and, and, and upon you. And, and uh, particularly when you get kids, uh, I mean, looking back, uh, we have twin boys, looking back, our twin boys are by far the most valuable, by far the most significant aspect of my life. But at the same time, when they were born, they are now 27. When they were born, the fact is, it affected my relationship with my special lady dramatically. This is just fact. And this is because uh, her primary focus went to the boys, as opposed to me. <laughs> you know, speaking in Formula One terms, I wasn't even the number two driver of the team, but some kind of test driver whose name you barely remember. I mean, that's how it should be. It's, it's, it's good for the boys and so forth, but uh, of course I did get occasionally, you know, something from the special lady. <laughs> I remember distinctively one particular Saturday, I, I said to the special lady, hey, let's go to the marketplace. There's, there's this nice, very nice marketplace in, in Helsinki. Hey, let's go to the marketplace, just the two of us. I mean, the boys can take care of themselves. And she said, okay, so let's go, but in order to save time, let's take your car. Now, we live on the street called Boulevardi, which is just a few blocks away from the marketplace. I mean, we right, live right in the center, so from my point of view, it would have been natural to walk. But we have a democracy in the family <laughs> that says that everybody can vote, but only her vote is counted. <laughs> So given the fact that she has voted for going in the car, it means we, we, we go in the car. So we come in the car, there was a marketplace. And I see this parking spot between two cars as we come down. Seems like a tight one. I evaluate the situation, put the car in the reverse, and take my car to this very, very tight spot beautifully. <laughs> you know, one of those masterful parking jobs. Not one of those cases where you try to take your car in and then too, le too late realize it's impossible and then you have to take your car out, that's humiliating yourself <laughs> in front of everybody. Not one of those cases, an absolutely outstanding parking job with the pack first and the special lady in the car who said, yes, it's nice to be in your car because you always park so well. <laughs> now, I was there with total poker face but thinking, that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the astonishing thing is that the, if, um, if one thinks about the, the uh, uh, movement ahead from that moment on, I was somehow uplifted, you would say. And, and it's almost like uh, this little incident would have hit my plus button, so to say. And, and of course this is you could say sort of naive conceptualization plus button. But if you think about this episode between uh, Mandela and the rugby captain, you could say, well, the rugby captain probably felt appreciated, respected, uh, in a way that in a sense you could say that his plus button was hit several times. As he was 10 seconds into the president's office, 10 seconds. Because by that time he had heard his name being said Francois by the president. He had seen the president leaving his desk immediately, coming towards him. He had experienced the president coming as it were uh, uh, more than halfway, extending his hand, uh, the, the, the warm warmth of his, his approach. You know, all this had happened in 10 seconds. And it's possible for a human being to experience that, but not only experience, also to be intelligent with all that. When it comes to the dynamic context that we share with one another. But just like I said, it's the case with economics, with the case of philosophy, with the case of psychology. I mean, you just go through all these departments. It could be that even elementary points don't get across to actual people, us. So, I mean, I got my doctorate at the age of 24. 
I did it very narrowly on philosophy and logic, and I enjoy, you know, uh, uh, the life of intellect as much as anybody. But there's life beyond that. I think we should take that seriously. I think this is uh, the behavioral operational research initiative. That's the sort of moral behind it. And, and this, this is, I think, uh, Raimo's uh, legacy. And, and, and it's, it's, I think it's such a powerful, such an important legacy. Now, think about it uh, from still slightly different angle. And, and uh, please excuse me for sort of uh, uh, making what seems like a side step. Side step. But in this uh, seminar where, uh, where we are re returning from when Raima made the initial suggestion of me coming here, it's been going on for years. I've had, uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, 40, 45 times now. So, so uh, <clears throat> once there was uh, one very successful IT guy and, and his uh, really tremendous lady. But they had a problem uh, of getting uh, a child. Well, uh, they had gone to various doctors they had undergone various kinds of treatments, but it didn't help. Well, they came to the Paphos seminar, and it <laughs> did help. Okay. And I mean, uh, it's sort of freaky, but it can happen. And, and, and uh, uh, so, so she did get pregnant there, uh, and, and uh, the, by the baby was born. From my point of view, you know, the Paphos baby. Okay. And uh, I've been very excited about um, infant research. The reason why I've been very excited about infant research is because the duet that the baby and the caretaker, typically the mother, forms is a very, very exciting system and in fact has been conceptualized precisely from that kind of point of view, systems point of view. Uh, because it turns out that the key point of infant research is that uh, contrary to what has been thought and might be thought even today uh, from outside, uh, the baby is very, very active herself in her own growth. In fact, she influences the system she's part of tremendously. I mean, you see this in, in, in these sort of heavy-duty businessmen uh, uh, with their uh, uh, grandchildren, you know, starting to speak completely differently, automatically. Because somehow the, the, the baby is imposing in this respect. You start to sort of search out for the attunement, the, the, the rhythm. Okay. So, so I've been uh, looking into infant research because, from my point of view, it's a key area of systems intelligence. And it's particularly interesting because it's obvious that conceptual reason don't take you anywhere there. If the baby is uh, two months of age. All right. So, I'm in one of the Helsinki cafes and, and reading one of the key researchers Beatrice Beebe, one of the best. She's really great, great, great. I admire her work so much. So I'm reading, reading Beatrice Beebe. She's at Columbia. Uh, I visited her lab and this is really fabulous. I'm reading one of her key papers. And then I see Yuri, this, this ID guy, with his son, you know, the Buffos baby. So, so, so uh, I, they come in, so I, I, I wave to them and they come to the table. I hadn't seen the babies, I was very excited. The baby was a few months old, maybe four months old, five months old at the time. So, so they come to my table and, and, uh, and Yuri is so happy and, and, and uh, 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 they, they, they sit there, the baby is on, uh, um, uh, on, on her father's uh, um, lap. And, and, uh, but I have just been reading this, this, this key paper by Bibi on infant research. So I started to talk to, to, to Yuri, you know, these key points, you know, systemic perspective on the infant research, you know, the tremendous points. 
and 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 the baby is there, you know, uh, like these babies are, you know, dimbly bum kind of stuff, you know, watching colors and whatnot, and and, and so 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 he he's there, you know, dimbly bum kind of thing. But as I, as I'm speaking about infant research, all of a sudden, the baby starts to look at me, <laughs> you know, clearly focusing. Hey, 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 this guy is talking sense. <laughs> I mean, the fact is, he started to focus upon me, and of course you could say, well, uh, it probably wasn't the points themselves that uh, he was following. Uh, and, and you could have the view that the only way for people to connect is through some kind of rational, objective, Content definable, measurable way. Alternative ways that well, people are quite capable of all kinds of ways to connect with holes. But some such ways might be, for whatever reason, they might have been pushed to, to the margin. So, so, uh, so what we. What what I believe this uh, that this indicates. Uh, let me say it still differently. It's, it's, it's something like the following. Uh, it's, it, it, it's like uh, starting to think about micro change in the sense in which when your special lady, if you're a guy, says to you, darling, I think that's enough. You could react to that constructively. You could have reflected upon that possibility in advance. I mean, that you, it's absolute, you can't deny it. The fact that you haven't been able to do it doesn't mean that you couldn't do it in the future. Uh, also, it could be that you apply your reflective powers to the case. So, uh, 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 and what might that mean? Well, you might, for instance, reflect upon uh, your life from the t t time span of, let's say, 30 years. You know, this kind of event is likely to happen again. Could I implement with some probability a micro change? So that's the, uh, that's the art of systems intelligent interventions thought about as a way of life. Uh, and, and it's, it's uh, the, the, the reason why I be believe this is so, so uh, powerful a possibility is because uh, what happens to us uh, thought-wise, often I, I, I think does are certain tricks. These are from Paul Ekman's research on facial expressions. Uh, and uh, I'm just reminding us of, of something. I'm, I'm not going into this in, in more detail, but I'm, I'm, I'm making a point regarding microbehaviors. I mean, if you think about, for instance, disgust, disgust, you said disgust and contempt isn't really that different from, let's say, showing interest. I mean, it, it really is, a, you could say, st a stunningly di small a difference, but still it's a major difference from the point of view of the experience of the other person. Uh, now, John Gottman is a leading researcher. This is one of her, his collaborators in the field of uh, marriage. <laughs> okay, and, and, uh, and, and what, what they have been doing uh, for decades is that they have followed couples in laboratory settings, coding the interaction of those, those couples. So in this case, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a marital conflict discussion. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a discussion on a theme in which uh, the husband and the wife have conflicting views. So it's a, it's a touchy theme for them. And, and, uh, and you have a coding system. The coding system exploits various aspects from other people's research. For instance, Paul Ekman's groundbreaking work on facial expressions. But we are not going into that in detail, what, what the system of coding is. Let's, because we are just looking at the overall picture. So you have a particular kind of coding system, and in that coding system, joy is, for instance, plus four. Humor is plus four. Affection is plus four. You see, this, this is good news. You know, validation is plus four. 
I mean, it's so easy to validate the other person. You just sort of uh, 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 express affection, it's easy. So uh, you, have, you have excellent uh, scoring possibilities here, just showing interest. Notice, if you are married with the person, you would say that you have good reasons to be interested in the person. Now, in this particular case, there were newlyweds. So you would expect the newlyweds to be interested in the other person's perspectives. It's sort of trivially easy to score. Uh, on the negative side, stonewalling is only minus two. If you are domineering, that's only minus one. Anger, only minus one. So, so uh, it's just one uh, minus four, and that's contempt. Even this gas is just minus three. Now, uh, if you look at this coding system, you would expect that people would do pretty well, particularly if they are newlyweds. Well, this is what uh, these people that their research actually did. Uh, this is 50 minutes of the conflict discussion. So this is the three, three minutes situation in terms of positivity in the husbands some of whom did divorce in six years' time, six years. So you, back, you go back after six years to the couples, because by that time you know, did they divorce or did they not divorce? Uh, and and uh, those that didn't divorce, it turned out during the first three minutes, scored considerably more than those that eventually did divorce. And, and the those that didn't divorce stayed pretty well uh, on the same level as, as compared to those that did divorce. You could say this is a, quite a difference, but this is just three minutes of conflict dis discussion in a laboratory context. This is negativity, husband negativity. I mean, if it's a touchy theme of money or where to move, or when to have children, whatever the theme is where we have a, a conflict you expect there to be some negativity. And there was some negativity even in stable, those that did stay stable, but considerably less so in those that did stay stable as compared to those that didn't stay stable, but surprising, uh, but even more remarkably, it, it went down a little bit, but it didn't really go that, that, that much down. So, so uh, and you could say, well, uh, as compared to what happened with the uh, 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 unstable ones, and this is, uh, the total scores, so, so uh, in, in the total scores, uh, those that uh, were unstable went uh, under zero during the first three minutes already. And of course, as opposed to those that uh, re remain stable. And what does that mean? It means that uh, apparently in the stable marriages, uh, even during the first three minutes, uh, somehow the husband is able we're just looking at the husband's side, but it's pretty much the same with the, with the ladies, but, but let's look at it this way. During the first three minutes, they just managed to generate, let's say, interest. Uh, in the context where there is a conflict, it's still possible. Now, of course, you can, uh, you, you can say here that, that uh, yes, uh, uh, you know, uh, people are different on the personality level, but if you take serious the theme of micro change, if you take uh, seriously the idea of systems intelligence, that is succeeding in a whole, you could say, well, wouldn't this seem to suggest that you have a pretty good reason to, to, uh, uh, to, to facilitate, facilitate this particular kind of behaviors as far as you're concerned? And, and you have, I, I think, a hard time in claiming that you couldn't do it. That is, you couldn't develop your system's intelligence vis-a-vis -vis that particular system's environment, which is marriage. And, 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 uh, and what, what I believe makes it very hard is, is something I like to uh, illustrate with the following. Uh, this is two years ago, a bit more. It's a clip from uh, the evening news, and, and, uh, and what it says is, uh, knife attacker charged with murder. This is what it says here. Uh, I, actually, the, the, the text is, uh, you could say, it's, it's overstatement, because the charge 
hasn't been raised by this time. It had just happened, this, this uh, knife attack on me, which, uh, uh, which, which was investigated as a murder attempt. This happened just uh, in the other building over there, which is now being renovated, where I used to have my lectures. So on the way to the lecture scene, I was attacked by a disturbed guy who tried to kill me with the knife that he, that he was hiding. And, and uh, he offered a back what he uh, uh, claimed is a present. So he came towards me and said, uh, Esa, I have a present for you. But then when he was close, he hit with full force with the knife he had been hiding in his left hand, a knife he, which he had bought that morning. Uh, and, and he had been waiting there for two hours for me to show up. Uh, uh, and there was a, a battle. Luckily, I was there with my assistant. So, so, so uh, uh, we, we managed to uh, um, take the knife out from the guy. And, 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 and uh, incredibly, uh, the, uh, the hit that did go in didn't uh, destroy any uh, uh, any of my uh, 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 key uh, internal organs. So, so, so uh, physically speaking, everything went well. Uh, and, uh, but it was quite, a, quite an event. Uh, and, uh, but I've been doing work with the fire brigade. So, so actually, I was quite excited, you know, when the fire brigade guys who, who drive the ambulances that come to the you know, occasions came. And, 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 and we left the scene with the sirens on. You know, this, I, I thought, this is, this is cool. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, if, if you are attacked with a knife and you leave the scene without the sirens on in the ambulance, I think it would have been an anti-climax. <laughs> so, so, so major disappointment. So, so, so we left the sirens blasting. And I, I, I remember being there thinking, uh, how is it possible that I haven't seen that there are so many good people around? Clearly, uh, I mean, this is a fact. Uh, I mean, it's extremely unlikely that somebody just wants to murder you. This clearly is an exception. Uh, and and uh, also, the way people reacted as, uh, uh, afterwards demonstrated the fact that, you know, uh, there are more people than I had sort of thought of. And, and uh, so the question to me was, uh, how is it possible I haven't seen that there are so many good, so, so, so many good people around? And, and, and my conclusion was, well, very often, uh, clearly, my thinking gets stuck with, uh, with surface defects. I mean, people have all kinds of defects, particularly in particular kind of uh, task environments. So you have dynamic context where people try to do things and somebody has a defect. But it could be that the defect is actually just a surface defect. But wouldn't your systems intelligence be something where you want to look at the whole, also from the point of view of the sort of Mandela kind of principle, wanting to bring from people the kind of dimensions out that perhaps they themselves don't really believe in. Meaning, this, this, uh, this, this, this idea of, of, of uh, attitude of, of looking in some positive way to the world. And, and, uh, but but it's, it's something that you can't, as it were, force yourself to do, which is the reason why I believe it's so important to create context of reflection like the one we are here. But as you do that, and this is now my last point, what you face, I think, is a major challenge of, of crucial significance. This is something that uh, uh, cognitive science uh, apparently uh, pretty powerfully has demonstrated to exist this kind of two different kinds of networks that are engaged if, if you are engaged in task oriented looking out kind of situation. So you are focusing up on a task, a particular kind of network is activated as opposed to if you are uh, reflectively looking in, 
So, so uh, uh, you have two networks, and as one network is increasing in gates, the other is decreasingly increased. But uh, adequate developmental opportunities for appropriate lapses in the outwardly directed attention uh, is, 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 is something that may be important for well-being and for optimal performance on focus tasks also. What this, from my point of view, I mean, I'm, I'm just a philosopher, so, so uh, I, I, I look at things as it were on, on, on some kind of rule of thumb level. Uh, I would say what this means basically, from the point of view of our actual lives, is that you can't engage at the same time in task-oriented thinking and free reflection. I mean, this isn't possible. It's something like this is actually the case. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means from your point of view that if you can't engage at the same time in task-oriented, outward-looking, uh, uh, productive thinking and free reflection, it's highly likely that you push aside this parameter of systems intelligence. And I would say this is exactly what happens most of the time to even the, the most intelligent people we are dealing with. And, and, and this means that, that the, 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 the high intelligence of the person, the IQ of the person, doesn't really help that much when it comes to really uh, succeeding in, in what Raimo in the plane said that, 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 that his effort in life is, what the engineer, systems engineer's idea is which is not just to describe something, but to improve holes. We do need reflection. And it's, at the, to repeat, but that reflection uh, leads us back to ourselves. And then that's why it leads to that realm that Konstantinos referred to with the CP Snow to uh, uh, cultures, uh, 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 characterization. That's the, that, 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 that's the realm of humanistic culture, more or less. It's, it, it provides ways for people to reflect, because the, the uh, let's say a novel, a no novel is not likely to be useful in terms of you finding a solution to a particular well-defined task. But you can't take away the fact that that there are these different dimensions in you that you actually already now have as capabilities. And the possibility that, that uh, this, this, this overall conceptualization, I, uh, I, I believe, usefully suggests, is, uh, is, uh, is a view upon us uh, uh, from the point of view of improvement. And, and, and that's why I would uh, suggest you to also to take our little, uh, little test on the, on the, on the website. Because it, it, it does give you feedback regarding where your strengths uh, on the basis of this uh, measurement uh, scale, where your strengths are and where your relative weaknesses are, as compared to other people that have, uh, that have already uh, made the test. And, but, but please do it realistically and, and do it from the point of view of that kind of overall Remembering the, the overall point uh, I, I started out with, which, which is uh, this, this point that the, there is more to us than meets the eye, more that is good. Now, uh, let me close all this with, with, with yet another... This is something quite, uh, I think, uh, powerful from uh, Atlanta Olympics. So, so it's the basketball final where we go to the intermission, where Muhammad Ali is going to come to the court in order to receive uh, a replacement for the gold medal he had won in Rome Olympics, which original medal he had lost, so he's going to get a replacement in a sort of semi-official little ceremony. Uh, maybe also uh, as a result of him having been so powerfully present in the opening ceremonies, lighting the Olympic flame. Uh, I would say anybody that saw it uh, never forgets it because it, it, it was so touching.
given that uh, uh, Ali has Parkinson, so, so uh, he's there with his trembling hand, lighting the Olympic flame. Because although he has lost uh, control over his body, he hasn't lost his human dignity. So he's going to come there, he's going to get uh, the, the, the gold, uh, and, and uh, uh, if you follow him closely, you can sense the emotional momentum building. Then when he gets the gold, uh, I think very touchingly, he picks it up and, and kisses it. And as this happens, please pay attention, because in the game itself, there is US Dream Team playing against a uh, Yugoslavia team. And what happens after Ali gets the goal is that uh, the Dream Team guys come and hug Ali. So please pay attention upon the effect this creates in one of the greatest athletes of all time. Okay, I'll stop it there. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's such, a, uh, such, such a powerful uh, reminder of, uh, uh, of, of the power of uh, human acceptance, human warmth, uh, also physical touch. It's, it's, uh, uh, I mean, one is tempted to say that, that Ali there almost physiologically changes right in front of our eyes and still the difference in terms of the objective uh, factors to what was there just a moment before is, 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 is you could say absolutely minimal. It, 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 it would have been an okay ceremony even without this continuation to it. Brought about by the, uh, by, the, by the system's intelligence of the three team players. And even among them, uh, the first player to come, who sort of tracks the others to the situation. And, and that and thus, thus makes it uh, more than it would have been otherwise. So, so, so that's the uh, kind of uh, vision regarding uh, succeeding in holes, su uh, succeeding in dynamic contexts, involving people and having the kind of plus button dimension hiding there somewhere that, that uh, we've tried to conceptualize with uh, systems intelligence uh, uh, concept and, and, and which represent from my point of view the kind of uh, uh, integration of the two cultures, really, that C.P. Snow was talking about in, in, in terms of w w wanting to look at uh, holes from the point of view of, of, of improving the holes, but taking into account uh, all that is there is in those holes, which is more than just what is there as, as objective factors in as much as there are people involved. Okay, dear friends, I'd like to stop there. Thank you very much for your attention.